Welcome to another episode of the On The Water podcast. I'm Jimmy Fee. And I'm Kevin Blinkoff. And this week, uh, we're going to be talking to Steve Gallant about surf casting for Big Stripe Bass on the North Shore of Massachusetts. But before that, we're going to uh, handle some reader questions. And because it's Albie season, Kevin, I figured we would, uh, we would focus on some of those. Our good friend Jonah from East Falmouth wrote in again. Jonah uh, wrote in for one of our early podcasts uh, because he was dealing with some very picky striped bass. Seems like he's having a similar issue right now, but instead of picky stripers, he's dealing with picky false albacore. Very common problem when it comes to false albacore. It is. I've been hearing a lot about that this year. Uh, guys seeing big schools of albies. I've dealt with it myself. I haven't caught an albie yet this year. Uh, we're about, you know, this, it'll be... Well, you've been focused on tuna. <laughs> I haven't caught one of those either, but let's, we're not going to go down that road. Uh, anyhow... The Albi, when I was Albi fishing, I saw very picky Albi. It's got some great casts into them and failed to hook up. I know you've caught a couple, but you've, you've also encountered a lot, of, uh, a lot of that this year. Yeah, people love, uh, fishermen love to talk about Albies and talk about the behavior. And they're such a, they're a funny fish. They're mysterious. It's tough to know, like, you know, where do they come from? What are they thinking? What are they doing? And so we come up with all these different theories, you know, and, and one, of my, one of them I've always heard is when they first show up on Cape Cod, like they're hungry, they're ravenous, they'll eat anything. Sometimes that's the case. Um, but so far, this early rush of fish that we've seen, particularly around Cape Cod, have been really tough. I was out uh, kayak fishing for them last week, saw a ton of fish um, coming out of the water, big feeds, good feeds, had more shots than I could ever ask for and only managed to get one strike and didn't hook up. Um, not very many fish caught for the number of boats out there in the feeds. So we definitely had some picky albies out there. Now, do you think that's bait related? Like that has to be associated to what they're feeding on at that particular time. I think it's definitely bait related because I've heard the same thing in different weather conditions. When I was out there kayak fishing, it was very calm. And sometimes, oh, you know, sometimes when it's like that, it's real calm. They get a good look at your lure. They can see your leader. That could cause them to reject your bait. Um, but I think it's because of what they're, they're feeding on. And so far... Um, the bait that we're seeing a lot of is peanut bunker, small peanut bunker, and they're really small. Um, they're getting a little bigger now. They grow pretty, you can see them grow by the week, but, uh, when the Albies first showed up, they're, t you know, barely bigger than thumbnail size and watching the Albies feed, it seemed like what they were doing was really kind of just open mouth ramming through the schools of bait. Yeah. Not singling out a single bait. Yeah. So they're not going through and picking out baits. So f to get one to actually hit your lure, they would have to stop what they're doing, you know, of, of just kind of ramming through with an open mouth and grabbing mouthfuls of bait. They'd have to turn off to go and grab a single lure and decide that's something they want to do. Or, and I heard some fishermen find success this way, floating a fly, you know, putting a fly in the middle of a feed where it just becomes part of that mass of bait and they happen to swim and, and grab it. So for your average person throwing epoxy or resin jigs, bringing them past a school like that, it can be tough to get them to turn away from that open mouth gulping to then go and attack your lure. Yeah, because generally the, what you're trying to do, if you see uh, Albies blitzing on a school of bait fish, you, you want to make that cast on the periphery of it. Like I always, I seem to do better when I cast on the edges of the school rather than right in the middle of it or beyond it. Um, if I can cast, lead the school, if I know what direction it's going, that seems to be the, the best odds of getting a bite. But in those situations, I know uh, Matt Hefner, our assistant editor here at On the Water, he caught one on one of those real picky days, and he said he just threw a dart of a cast right into the middle of the school of the Albies pushing the bait, and then he yeah, managed I was, to hook up. I was up. out there. I saw that happen. I don't know. that. I don't know. He may have got, landed it directly into a fish's mouth, but I think that what happens there is you're just right in the middle of the feed that is just so aggressive, and if you can throw that lure and splash it down, it's enough to get one fish just to turn and, and have that reaction strike, perhaps. Um, and it, that managed to work for him. So that's, I guess it's a good piece of advice for Jonah. Hey, maybe just, uh, try and see if you can throw that lure directly into the middle of a feed or what I'm doing. I'm kind of, uh, focusing some other things, getting things ready around the house, uh, so that I can focus more on kayak fishing for Albies when that bait gets a little bigger. I've already heard that they're feeding a little better now that, um, a little less picky. I think the, the peanuts just to getting, getting them a little bit bigger like that, the Albies will start to be more, you know, they're starting to chase down and eat individual baits, which makes them more likely to say, turn on a fly or a lure or something like that. I would say the, the pickiest albies I've ever seen is when they're on what people, some people call snot bait. It's, it's usually bay anchovies that are so small that it really, I mean, they can fit on your pinky finger and it just looks like a, a little bit of, of goo. I mean, you can see eyes and brown goo kind of. And they swim through and again, open mouth. It's almost like basking sharks filter feeding. 
they're just gulping as much of it as they can. And those are the pickiest ones I've ever seen. You can't get them to stop doing that to hit a lure at all. And, and those are the ones where they'll come up on the surface and almost in unison kind of swim across the surface, filter feeding through the school. And it, it makes for a spectacular sight. Like it's visually spectacular to see the Albies doing that, but so frustrating. I, I've seen that off the south side of Cape Cod a few times. Um, but when they're on a little bit bigger bay anchovies, they seem to be really receptive to, uh, to bigger lures. bay anchovies, bigger peanut bunker, um, silver sides. When they're feeding on bait like that, it's often a much splashier, more violent feed, and that's when you know they're they're attacking individual fish and individual baits. And I think that's when they're easiest to fool, most aggressive. The toughest albies I ever saw, uh, besides those like filter feeding ones, was one time there was a ton of floating. Um, I don't know if it was sargassum. That would be a long way for that to drift in, but it was floating weed, bubble weed in there. And they were feeding on something around that, but it was a real gentle. They were kind of coming up and almost sipping like trout. And you could see they were clearly albies. I was in my kayak floating among them. And, uh, you know, it was just one fish would rise here, another fish would rise there, and it was so tough to get them to eat. Uh, it was, I think the biggest lure I had with me was what finally got one to turn on, an almost a reaction uh, strike. But that's my, that's my picky albie story. Yeah, and, and another thing I'll add, um, one thing I have seen when they are picky, soft plastic baits, um, especially, you know, Albi Snacks, really popular Albi lure. There's really nothing else quite like it. They seem to work really well, and I think part of the reason they do is because they stay in the feed. They don't, you don't have to retrieve them as fast. You fish them on the surface, and I did see some fish get caught on Albi Snacks where they clear, the fish clearly turned away from the feeding and came over to investigate and see this thing that's splashing along on the surface like that. So sometimes, you know, something that's totally different from what's in the water, a bigger bait, a bait that moves along, splashes along the surface, does something different, is enough to get a curious fish to change its mind, leave what it's doing, and go hit your lure. But uh, also, one, circling back to the one thing you said was on rougher days, they feed better. One of my favorite Albi days was Tropical Storm Dorian. I want to say that was 2017, maybe? Mm -hmm. Maybe it was 2019. But that was a really rough day, and... It was, if you could just get a lure anywhere near them, they ate it. I mean, they were, we were in Buzzards Bay. Do you remember that? I do, yeah. Yeah, we were out in Buzzards Bay in our kayaks and fishing kind of a protected harbor there. And toward the mouth of the harbor, it got really rough. And you chased fish out there. And I remember, remember seeing you in one of these rollers about four feet. I was looking up at you, you know, over my head fighting a fish that was charging through another wave. And that was, and that was one of the best Albi days I think I've ever had. So those, uh, we've definitely got some stormy weather ahead. Much like surf casting a lot of times. As long as it's safe enough, you get out there um, when a storm's rolling in in the fall, turns up the water, turns up the bait, that's when you get fish feeding and feeding with abandon. So That, that was a good segue there. Good segue. Let's yes. get into it. Steve's going to talk a lot about surf casting, the conditions he likes, the lures he likes for the fall run on the North Shore of Massachusetts. The On the Water Podcast is brought to you by Guidesly. Are you looking to book a fishing trip with a renowned hand-selected expert in the field? Guidesly has the best guides in the best destinations. Whether you've never fished before or you're a regular on the water, let Guidesly hook you up with the best captains in your area. They'll put you on the best catches of your life. You can search and book your dream trip now on Guidesly.com or download their app, Guidesly Fishing Trips. Book a Guidesly trip today and create memories that will last a lifetime. Welcome to another episode of the On The Water Podcast. This week, we're going to do some surf casting talk with one of our columnists and experienced North Shore surf caster. I mean, you go everywhere, not just the North Shore. Um, yeah, but I primarily the North Shore. So, Steve Gallant. Steve, thank you very much for coming down to the Cape. Man. Thank you for having me. So, Steve, you're a, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're a fourth generation striped bass fisherman. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Um, I don't I, know. I'm a first generation striped bass fisherman. So, yeah, so to have um, those kind of roots is pretty cool. My grandfather and great grandfather um, both grew up in Gloucester. Um, striped bass fishing, lobster fishing. Um, so that ran in my family growing up. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. I started primarily, um, surf fishing with my, one of my cousins on my, my grandfather's side. Uh, my cousin, Nate, um, used to take me out surf fishing when I was, you know, middle school, high school age. Um, but I mean, I, I, I started fishing when I was pretty young, um, I remember asking my mother for, you know, if we could go out and dig a can of worms and, you know, <laughs> if we could go down to the reservoir. So, um, but yeah, I've been um, fishing for stripers since I was a kid. 
Awesome, man. Yeah, and you do a lot of, you do large mouth bass, like on Instagram. I have I see been um, a lot more in the last few years, mm -hmm. been, you know, dabbling into the freshwater. Um, large mouth being primarily the, uh, the focus, but yeah, primarily a surf guy. Exactly, man. And you, you create some great, um, not just, you get great, uh, photos out there with Brian O'Connor. I yeah. mean, you guys. Yeah. Shout out, Brian. <laughs> surf fishing pictures or photographs are some of the toughest. It's tough to do that well. Yeah. And you guys have really, I mean. So yeah, we're, um, I'm, I'm very fortunate to fish with Brian. He's a really talented, um, surf fisherman and photographer. And uh, he's definitely, it's great to have a guy that will, as soon as, you know, you hook a fish, he's there, you know, grabbing a camera and, you know, hope, I, he's great because we get a lot of those like in the moment shots, you know, where it's not just your typical grip and grin, it's, you know, like trying to land a fish in the surf or releasing a fish or something like that, or even fighting a fish mid fight. Um, so yeah, I'm very fortunate that I fish with him quite a bit, and and, uh, and you do a lot of uh, video editing too on the side. Like you, yep, uh, you were um, ahead of the the time with that. I mean, you, I remember you putting out some surf fishing videos. Man, it had to be six, seven years ago. Yeah, I so I got a GoPro years ago, and um, I was doing reports for Surfland at the time. Um, so I was years ago. I used to live down on Palm Island. I lived uh, in a little cottage. And I was like three doors down from Surfland, and it was it was the it was the best place to be at the time. It's I mean, a great surf fishing shop, and it's one of those great local shops too. Man, yep. I've been in there a few times. Anytime I'm up there that way, I have to yeah, stop. Yeah, it's in. one of the most legendary, and I mean, it's one of those places that you go in and you'll get sidetracked talking to someone for an hour, and it's so surf casting centric too. Like you just see stuff in there that you never ever see in other tackle shops. It's just really really focused for the surf fish i mean i mean they have they have gear for boat guys too but it's really really geared towards the surf caster yeah and there's not that many shops like that like i could think red top you know where the surf red top's definitely the one of them red top's one you've got paulie's in montauk um grumpy's in jersey's another yep. one but but up here like, yeah it's surf but land. surfland is i mean if anyone's like looking for a real specific surf caster thing i'm always send them to Surfland before they, you know, go looking elsewhere. So you said you were writing the reports for them. You got yeah, your GoPro. so I was, I was writing reports for them, um, and then I got a GoPro, and I started kind of just editing, putting stuff to music. Um, I mean, I grew up watching snowboard and skate videos, and that was always just like short, you know, quick edits to, to music. Um, and so I kind of wanted to try and bring that style a little bit to the fishing, you know, uh, surf casting world. And so that's kind of what I was going for there. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's the type ugh right around that time is when you started to see that come on the fly fishing side of things and it, it did it had that like yeah the fly fishing and surf, film so tour mm -hmm. and yeah so but just, nobody was doing it for surf fishing that's a you know it's i, I think it, it filled a little bit of a niche at the time but i think some other people have kind of you know since uh figured out that that's a you know entertaining way to present surf casting i mean the toughest part of all of that i mean you can be great with cameras you can be great with editing but the 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 main part of it is being able to catch the fish. So and yes, that's, uh, I mean I can't tell you how many hours and hours of footage I have of like, you know, me standing on a rock just casting. Um, you know that I just end up deleting afterwards. So or you know just blackness in the surf. Um, I tried fishing. <laughs> I, I tried filming at night, and as you know, filming at night, especially in the surf, is super difficult. So. Um, I ended up, the last couple of videos I've shot were just shot like with a camera on a tripod, you know, behind me somewhere um, and tried to shoot during the daytime because it's, it's a lot easier to get footage like that. Do you catch some incredible fish during the day too. Like I, I want to get to that a little bit later. First, I want to start with, uh, you know, take us through, let's start at the beginning of your surf fishing season up there. So you said you stick to mainly the North Shore. I mean, you do some traveling. But, yeah, but a little that's... bit here and there. I mean, I, I'll go visit some friends down in Rhode Island, especially in the fall and do a little fall surf casting. Um, but I'm, I'm definitely a homebody when it comes to surf casting. I, I have my areas that I'm, I know and I'm comfortable and I've spent a lot of time at. And I think there's something to be said for that. Then, you know, people that are always out just like, well, I go here in the spring and then I'm driving here and I'm at it. You're at a different place every weekend. And I mean, it's one thing to chase the bite like that, but to really dial in your home waters. And I'm also fortunate because, I mean, a lot of people don't have home waters that support, you know, trophy class fish. So I'm very fortunate that I don't have to travel far from home to to get that. But um, 
springtime is all about the estuaries for us. So when they show up in the spring, I mean, we start off doing our schoolie fishing in the, you know, in the estuaries and the rivers and stuff like that. Obviously that water warms up the fastest. Um, we do get fish that will, you know, go by the beaches and go by the rocks and stuff like that. But it seems like that bite in the spring is very, I feel like those fish are in transit. They're just, they're heading to where they're going that time of year. They're either looking for warmer water or they're following the bait that is also heading up in those rivers. Um, but the springtime is all about the estuaries for us. Um, and I also find that the estuaries tend to be the most predictable, like the spring is the most predictable time of year. Um, if they're gonna be there, I feel like I have a really good idea of like the times and tides that they're gonna be there. The general, it's you know generally like a two week window that if they're gonna show up, and luckily this year they, they did show up again. Cause I'm always like worried that it's, is this gonna be the year that they don't, <laughs> like that those big fish just don't yeah, show you up. You see some you know? big fish in the backwaters compared to what we see here on the Cape. Like our, our spring fishery is predictable in, you know, say the salt ponds and yep. some of the rivers, but if you catch a 30 incher, you're doing something. And you guys are, are well north of that with some of your fish. Uh, yeah, I mean, I got a fish that was probably well over 40 pounds this spring and way up in an estuary, I mean, probably 10 feet of water or less. Wow. Um, and I think another thing that we've kind of figured out over the last few years, and I heard this on a somewhat recent episode, I think it was of the podcast you did with, um, uh, who's the captain in Boston? I can't think of his name. Brian oh, Coombs. Coombs, yeah, yeah. And uh, he was talking about finding striped bass in areas where they were digesting. And I think we've kind of located some of those areas where these big fish come in in the spring and they maybe do some eating out in the bay, out in some colder water, and then they shoot up in the estuary. And then, you know, cause we'll find them in places where it's shallow. And like Brian was describing, like they're just kind of mulling around up on the surface. Yeah, and like you, there's you, no good reason for them like, to be there. And you're like, why are these fish here? And it's, it, it kind of clicked after I listened to that episode. I was like, that's, that's what they're up there doing. Like yeah, they're they, up there digesting. You they know? can't eat 24 seven, you no. know? So there's definitely some place they go where you know when they're just hanging out when they're staging getting yeah. ready to move or getting ready to eat and uh i've seen i've seen places like that too where you think like why are these fish sitting yeah. here there's not much current and we'll there's spook no them in areas and it's like well there's big fish here you know and it's like but you put the right thing in front of them and they'll still eat you know so now what's uh if, if you can share what is the right thing well, so the right thing in the past before this season used to just be a live eel. But this year um, I've been using uh, I've been big using the gravity tackle eels this year. Um, and I've had really, really good success this spring with them um, to the point where I didn't even purchase a single live eel this spring. Oh, good for still you, haven't man. purchased a single live eel this year. Oh. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I'm still dabbling in the eels, but I'm trying to get more into the big soft plastic thing yeah. too. Those are such cool looking baits, man. And, I mean, and I a big saw, profile. I watched for years, well, not for years, but for the last couple seasons, I've watched guys, um, you know, a lot of boat and kayak guys just crushing it like on those things. And it's, it, if, if that works and there's no reason it, if it's working for the boat guys, there's no reason it shouldn't work for the surf guys either. The only caveat is that, you know, boat guys, obviously, sometimes it's just a matter of dropping it down. So when the surf, you know, casting distance is an issue. Um, yeah, they have, they're, they're kind of a so it's sort wind of, resistant. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very wind resistant. Um, but they, what's nice is that they do come with um, different size jig heads. So, you know, in the estuaries this year, I was using like a half ounce jig head. Um, that was working really well. In some shallower situations, I was throwing them weightless. Um, and then I've been trying a little bit off the rocks and some deeper water using like a three quarter and a one ounce jig head. So yeah. what I like that you have something for, you know, any part of the water column that you're trying to target. Now, what's your retrieve like with those? You it varies. It um, it's usually just kind of a, a medium to steady retrieve. And then I'm, you know, working the rod tip. I'm, I'm making that thing, you know, dance and work its way. Uh, and giving it some life and I don't know you know there were nights that I fished with Brian this spring uh, when he was throwing a live eel and I was throwing a soft plastic and I outfished him you know so I don't know if it's a matter of you know you kind of being able to give it that action um, that looks a little different to a fish than maybe an eel um, 
I, I'm not sure. I always, um, with, with the artificials, I always thought it was that you can control better where it is. Like, I know yeah, where that is in the water column. Whenever I'm fishing a live eel, like, there's the element of he's going to do his He own could thing. be flopping yeah. around up on the top. <laughs> he could be, although, I mean, I've always been told that, you know, most eels' instinct um, is to just head straight down. Um, but obviously, after you fished an eel for 15 minutes, it's they start to, you know, get beat up or um, they're not swimming quite as as well and um especially when they die they tend to float you know so yeah they're a pain in the ass man i don't yeah they are and that's another thing too is it's like i don't miss at all having to go get them um having to keep them alive in a tank in my garage you know um so it's they're always ready to go i can put them in my bag i don't have to worry about beating them up too much like walking to the spot getting there and you're like oh well these are all dead you know because i walked two miles and now, would you use the eel jug, or did you have them in a mesh bag? I or had. Uh, I tried not to bring too many with me where I was going. Um, I would maybe try and bring six or seven eels max. Mm. So what I had was a little um, gear up eel pouch okay. that I would keep on the back of like my uh, belt, and then inside that I would keep them in a big. Uh, mesh bag so I would you know especially if I was waiting it's usually on your waist so you're getting it in and out of the water a bunch so they're getting water Um, they're in a mesh bag so it's just coming up and it's getting them wet keeping them alive Um, and it was pretty easy to deal with and then I liked it because it wasn't like a mesh bag that was like tied off to your belt because I found that you know if you're walking any distance and you're doing that with a bag it tends to like slap into your leg and that that tends to kill the eels pretty quick the other reason i don't like the mesh bag hanging off your belt is one time i was it, it was a crazy bite rob taylor um charter captain now with newport sport fishing charters but big time surf fisherman yeah. too invited me down to newport it was going to be a long swim he's like you bring the eels we're going to catch some giant fish yeah. that mesh bag opened up on the swim and there was one eel left and i was like here you uh, take it. You yeah. got a big fish on, and then we, yeah. we like scratch one or two on jigs. But yeah, yeah. The I, I've been an eel jug guy after that. But your system seems very secure, and also uh, yeah. I mean, it, it took a little trial and error. I mean, I remember the first night I went out there, I didn't think to put the eels in a mesh bag, so I just had them in the like the rigid sort of like canvas pouch. And as soon as I opened it, and I was out in the surf, and like a wave came up, it just lifted up all the eels, and like eight of them, like you know, a bunch of them just uh, escaped. So it was the same deal. It was like I had like one left at that point, and I was like, all right, note to self: next time, put them in a mesh bag, and then put that inside there, you know. So trial and error. <laughs> exactly, man. I mean, that's the coolest part about surf fishing is like a lot of the guys, the real serious guys, they're figuring out little. There's little hacks and tricks that you oh. get just from going out night after night. Man. Yep. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of other just, um, you know, I didn't have a ball. Bo- I didn't have a bag with a water bottle holder for a while. Um, my next bag that I purchased after that, I was like, yeah, I'm making sure to get a water bottle holder yeah. for that because I was taking like one of my tubes out and put sliding a water bottle in. So there's a little trick. If you have like a four tube bag, you can take one of those tubes out and, uh, you know, put one of your water like bottles your in there if you don't need all the plug space. So are you a, uh, with your plug bag, do you like it over your shoulder? Or you I'm keep a shoulder guy. I yeah. am too, man. Yeah. And, and I, I tried the belt for a little bit uh, this year. I didn't like it, but part of the problem is I took my, my big four tube shoulder bag yeah. and put it on my belt and I felt like my pants are falling down the whole night because it's just too heavy. So, I mean, my thing with the shoulder bag or not having it permanently attached to your your belt is that if you're wading in water that is over your waist it makes it super hard to get at anything like if your plug bag is permanently stuck in your waist and you're in waist deep water you know you're either fighting to keep that stuff in your bag sometimes so i mean some of the spots that we were fishing were we were wading pretty deep out on the beaches so i mean you would literally take your plug bag and open it up and you'd be in a wetsuit and you'd have to like lift that up and out of the water and get what you're getting out and then you know then you can put that back in the water yeah i I get why the guys like it's a little bit easier on your shoulder and your back but like it's it's funny man when even when i don't have a plug bag on it's so ingrained in me i'll cast and then do the like push it yeah you push it behind you just push it there yep um yeah that yeah that's one of the uh yeah and then i mean i like all right, so do you have a particular side? I always keep it on the same side. If I put my plug bag like on the other, you know what I'm saying? Like drape it across your shoulder and put it the other way, it screws me up completely. So, yeah, it's on my opposite side. It has so to be right down. here. It's on my left side. I have my pliers on this. No, I have my, my lip gripper on this side and my pliers on this side. I don't have one of those real kitted out belts. No, me neither. Like I, I'm, I'm more, my belt's more like pliers, lip gripper, 
and knife. Yeah. And then and then everything else is in the bag. Yeah. If I'm fishing on the rocks, I usually don't even wear a belt. I'll just have my pliers like in my back pocket or in one of my pockets and then I just have a boga grip attached to my plug bag and then my plier, you know, that's that's pretty much all I need. And you do a lot of I see in the pictures of surf fishing in I mean you're in shorts. You're not I, on rocks like you fish, waders would almost be It would dangerous. be dangerous. Um, the rocks that we fish are more akin to like a cliff. Mm -hmm. It's just a cliff face. Um, so you can't, there's no waiting to be done. I mean, I guess you'd almost be, it would almost be safer to wear like, um, just like deck boots and just like a long pair of, you know, bib pants or something mm -hmm. like that. If you were that concerned with yeah, like trying to, to stay. At all, yeah. Um, but yeah, waders would be a bad idea only because if you did end up getting taken off your feet and into the water, um, obviously, then you're dealing with your waders filling up with water um, and having that to deal with. But um, spikes are a must for where we fish. Those rocks are super slippery. So to get a grip on those rocks, you said they're super slippery. What's your uh, what's your boot look like? Um, I actually use it's an NRS boot um, and it's just a neoprene um, sort of looks like a work boot. Um, but I really like it because it's, it's neoprene dries really fast. And then I use a pair of the corker. I think they're the cast tracks. Yeah. Um, and they're just the clip on ones and they fit so perfectly. And I've just been using them for years. I'm super comfortable with it. And it's it's really easy to just throw in my truck. I have it, especially in the fall, like where I'll just go like right after work or something like that. I just have that stuff. If I come up on a blitz, it's just boom, throw your corkers on. And like I could throw them on, on over my sneakers if I had to, you know, like if I was in that much of a rush. Now, do you modify the corkers at all? Nope. I just try and, you know, obviously the, stud, the studs fall out after a while, so I'll, you know, replace them. But no, nothing special to them. The, the only thing I used to do to, I, I used to use the cast tracks a lot. And then I start, uh, net, right now I'm in like a, I'm drilling the studs into my boots. Yeah. But when I used the cast tracks, what always would help them stay on for me a little bit better was a zip tie on the back too. Really? So, yep, yeah, you got, you changed the angle of the laces coming across the front. Uh. And they wouldn't come loose quite as often. Interesting. Only. That was have something you I, have you ever tried the bars on the rocks? Yes, the aluminum bars are great on dry or non. If there's no vegetation, they're okay. great, but if not good on any sort of useless. weed or anything like that. Because unlike the, the you've got the carbide studs and they're yeah. biting into the rocks. Yeah. The bars are just they're conforming to the rock itself, okay. so it's not going to cut through slime. Like I tried it at the canal, almost killed myself. Yeah, I've always seen that. Yeah. I'm like, I wonder if the bars work on the rock. I guess I won't try that now. It, it's a great river thing, great dry, dry yeah. rock thing. Not ideal for uh, for the surf. Good to know. So you've got, uh, so anyhow, we're, we're going off on a lot of tangents yeah, here, we're, 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 it's fine. After the estuary, um, yeah. so where, how's the bite evolve from there for you? So we usually will play that out. That's water temperature dependent. Um, those fish will, you know, hang out in the estuaries until that water starts to get, you know, really warm, you know, pushing 70 degrees, then we'll start seeing those fish push out. Um, from there, it's usually, you know, fishing along the rocks, looking for cooler water at the time of year. Um, and then it's bait driven, like we were talking about earlier. It's, um, it's, it's finding the bait, it's finding the pogies. It's, you know, um, we're getting into August now. So it's looking for schools of peanut bunker. Um, unfortunately, like those days that we used to have, you know, it used to be in the summer, it was like, well, okay, after the spring bite, then we'll have our summer resident fish, you know, bite. But those days have kind of come and gone. Um, we don't have really the resident summer fish. We used to be able to go and, you know, you walk the beaches at night with a bunch of eels and you had a really, really good shot at, you know, getting some really nice fish and those fish just don't seem to be there anymore. It, it's, it's amazing how the fishery changes so much. And, and, you know, some of that's probably related to, uh, definitely related to uh, population dynamics, but also I think as the bait fish populations change, I mean, we're yeah. seeing so many bunker now, so many yeah. pogies. And, and they why, just... why go, you know, cruise the surf for a couple sand eels or a couple crabs when there's a massive massive school of pogies that's you know a few hundred yards away so if you can fill up on them and you it's you know they're not going to work they're going to work smarter they're not going to work exactly harder yeah so they uh the bunker are, are they're like my best friend sometimes and my worst enemy more often than not i think as a surf fisherman because they do pull the fish off the beach yes but when they come in man, but when they incredible. get pinned against the beach it's the best thing that could you know it's yeah it is a really a love-hate relationship with the bunker you know but peanuts is they're a different story peanuts are a different story um 
peanuts just seem to do something different to the fish. Like they, they, they just, it's reckless abandon with the, with the peanuts. It's with the bunker. It's, it's, you know, you see occasionally like something will come up and, and take one and it'll blow a hole in, in the school. And with the peanuts, it's just like, you'll just see an entire wall of striped bass, like with their mouth open, like heading into something or like bluefish too. I mean, bluefish will obviously um, get on the pogey schools too, but I think it's just something about the smaller nature of the, the peanut bunker that they don't really have to wait for that like right moment to like get one, you know, away from the school or slow one, you know, slow one down a little bit. It's just, it's carnage. It's just straight carnage the whole time. It's true. Yeah, that, that's a good point, man. Like they don't have to separate one from the herd like no. they would with an adult bunker to get that advantage with the peanuts. It's like they're they, just, they, they just, just they go in full speed. And um, yeah, last fall, I mean, I don't know, knock on wood, maybe we'll see it again this year, but up where I'm at, you know, in the North Shore, we had just an insane fall run last year from about for you know probably three weeks like the end of august through maybe second or third week in september so you, you, your fall run begins in august oh yeah for sure i mean as yeah it's it starts in august i would definitely say that um we've been seeing already like you know uh some smaller bait moving its way in um but for sure i would say this time, you know, these days, the fall run starts in August. And that was, uh, I never really heard that until we had those good canal years in the mid teens. Yeah. And you would see the fish come in. We'd have great blitzes in mid August. And then those fish would leave. And some of the old timers would be like, they're gone. Like don't the, those fish, they've, they've already migrated South. Like the fall runs begun. Yeah. And to me coming from New Jersey where our fall run didn't begin until Halloween some years, yeah. it, you know, it was a rude awakening. Like, yeah. Holy, like, holy shit. I need to get, I need to get my stuff together and really get ready to fish now, you know? Hard. Yeah. Um, I mean the best fishing, I mean, like I said, we were super fortunate that we had just a massive influx of peanuts last year and we had a few weeks of, it was just depending on where it was, it would pop up in a certain cove or an area and you would, they'd be there for a day or two. And then, you you know, a day or two later, they'd pop up a mile or so, you know, or then they'd come back to an area. So yeah, we were, you know, that was very exciting. Um, but then come October, I, I, it's definitely been ending earlier and earlier every year. Um, you know, I know that you're a fan of that, that late season mythical, you know, it's like, Late October, early November cow, and it's I think a the dream, latest yeah. I've got one, I think I got one October, uh, Halloween a few years ago, I got like a 30 pound fish, probably four or five years ago, and that was, I was like, wow, this is late, you know, for us up there, oh, so, yeah. yeah. That's, uh, something about, um, I don't know if you ever read the book by Frank Dano, The Trophy Striper, and it was like he goes, he talks about his friend who was a, like a super optimistic fisherman. And he had a reason for every month. Yeah. And he's like, if you, uh, for November, it was like, they're coming down from Maine where they ain't been fished, was yeah. like what the guy would say. And then December is like, you get one now, he'll be fat as a bastard. And like, and that, that prevailing wisdom of like, the last ones are coming down, these ones haven't been fished hard, and they're enormous. And that's what always kind of drives me out a little bit later and it never pays off. Like I, I'm still waiting for my mid November yeah. uh, giant fish, but I used to fish really late up. Um, when I lived on Palm Island, I used to fish into November down on the refuge. And, um, I feel like that's Palm Island is a really good area for late season fishing. Um, I caught a really nice fish down there years ago. Um, also right around the October Halloween time frame. Um, and it's, I like fishing that time of year too, cause there's like almost nobody out. Um, it is just nothing but diehard fishermen at that point. Uh, and there's a lot of guys that fish the rocks too, pretty late into the fall. Um, but that is very hit or miss. Um, you can kind of tell, like, I, I feel like I can tell when it's over. The water just gets like this gray, steely look to it. It and looks it's just, lifeless. It like, looks lifeless. It's yeah. clear. It's so clean. And yeah. you, you do. You hit that point and you're like, oh, it's not looking like it, it did in mid-September yeah. when it was full of life and bait. And yeah. It's, that's always a sad feeling. You yeah, know? it it's is. Like, um, and just like, I don't know. I think I feel like I've been doing it long enough now that my gut just tells me, like, okay, just give it a rest, you know? <laughs> like... I've been learning to listen to my gut a lot more recently. Um, just, you know, I've 
been getting to a place of like, ah, this just doesn't feel right tonight. You know, you give it a half a dozen casts and you're just like, no, nah, I, I, it doesn't feel right. Better doing that and like saving the energy for another, because man, I mean, you work, you have a full-time job and you have a very I'm, taxing job. I'm a here. carpenter, so yes, I'm out doing physical things all day in addition to, you know, doing physical surf casting when, when we do go out and do it. So to conserve the energy on a night, instead of going out and scra trying to scratch out a couple schoolies, you know, wiser to, uh, to save it, man. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the other reasons I kind of like fishing the rocks too is um, it's not, you're not taking a two and a half, three mile walk, you know, down the beach to find your fishing spot. So, I mean, I can, I can set up a, like a little route or something where I can go hit three or four different spots in a couple hours and you're not wa you're walking maybe five, 10 minutes into each spot, you know? But the hardest thing is parking, you know, right? especially around the Gloucester Rockport area. And that, it's I mean, that's true so many places hard. where it's like finding the, you can find the spot. Yeah, but, but where are you gonna park? Yeah, where are you gonna get your car and, and how are you gonna access it legally? Legally. on the right side of the yep. law. And um, that's something that's becoming an increasing, increasingly difficult for surf fishing from Jersey on up to, to yep. us, man, so. I was surprised I went down to, when I went down to Rhode Island a few years ago to visit some friends, um, how accessible some of the areas down there are, though. They are much more friendly to surf casters uh, in some of the, I think we were around Jamestown and some of those areas down there. And it was like, there was parking all over the place for surf casters. I was like, wow, I'm like, this would be amazing at home, you know? I went down, I, I went down there um, earlier this year. Somebody, a, a friend of mine in a boat said, oh, I'm catching some good fish there. But chasing the boat reports never pans out for yeah. me. It's always like, I'm catching fish every drift with eels. Like, you could probably reach them from shore. Yeah. Turns out, what, what you think you could reach from shore from you a boat. You have to have a really long pass to reach <laughs> those from shore. But I, I'm, I'm like, okay, you know, let's let's try to figure out the, the creative uh, parking and access situation. I'm like, oh, like there's a parking lot right there. So, yeah. Oh, oh, and a path. Oh, yeah. well, this was easy, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty challenging. Um, we've definitely been riding bikes to some of the spots. That's been pretty helpful. Um, and it just helps you get away from some of the, obviously the most accessible spots are going to be the most crowded spots. Um, so if you take a little extra effort to get off the beaten path, then hopefully you'll have a little less uh, company with you. Yeah, yeah, it pays off, man. And you said uh, you said earlier that you, you have kind of a list of areas that you will check in the fall looking yeah. for that activity. So are you looking for just birds, just bait? What's, yeah. How, how um, soon do you know when it's time to move on? Um, birds and bait. I mean, that's exactly what you're looking for, reading the water. Sometimes it's just looking for those pockets of nervous water. Um, peanut bunker especially, like if birds on, on, aren't on them, you'll, it'll kind of have that shimmery, kind of like that nervous water to the look, or a nervous look to the water. Um, obviously, if there's birds on it, that's pretty obvious. Um, seagulls, if we get, you know, gannets and stuff, gannets start dive bombing from way up above, that's usually a dead giveaway. Um, it, it, this time of year, especially, it, it's just so bait driven, so, I mean, there's a few, there's some spots that I'll go to and I will, if I'm not seeing anything, I'll still give it a, you know, half hour of blind casting. If it's what I've figured is the, a good tide to be there. Um, but other spots, like if I'm not seeing anything, I'm probably not even going to get out of the truck. Um, so definitely a pair of binoculars is very important this time of year or in the fall, at least. And that, that seems to be the perfect approach for the fishery as we have it right now, where it's so feast or famine. Like I, I I'm experiencing, like I'm either going to catch a bunch of fish or I'm not going to catch any, like the nights of going in and, and really trying to fish hard for three bites, yeah. you know, it just doesn't happen. It's like, you're either doing all or nothing is, yeah. is the way it's well, felt. I mean. To be honest, like even the good nights, what what I would call good nights this spring, I think the best night I had this spring was like three big fish in a night. And we used to have nights where it was like, you would catch 10 or 12 of those fish. So, um, and you're working hard for those three fish. And don't get me wrong, I'm really grateful to be able to catch those fish. Um, but like I said before, I'm afraid of that year that none of those big fish show up. So I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that that doesn't happen. You know? Yeah, it's so much for me has been, I've been very slow to adapt to the new, our new fishery with the bunker. Like they yes. definitely, they move and they do different things when they're on these baits. And uh, I've been, I feel like I'm the slowest guy to catch up to it because I, I like when they're on baits that stay. If they're coming in and they're eating crustaceans or they're eating scup, 
Like that's a predictable the, pattern that's going to repeat. Yeah. And they're coming back to those same areas night after night because it's like, well, they're coming to this area because there's a lot of lobsters or it's a rocky area. They're not coming to that area. They're going to another area because there's pogies in that area or there's bunker in that area. So if there's not bunker in that area, they're not going into that area. And the bunker moves so much. And so and, much. You know, and then we have the boats that are coming in and netting massive amounts of those pogies. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's, it's challenging. Now, the peanut the numbers of peanuts you've been seeing last year obviously was a good year. It was a boom year. Is for it sure. pretty consistent, though, year to year? You see I them? feel like we have seen more and more peanuts in the last few years. Um, it's Then it's a matter of will there be, you know, large amounts of bass or bluefish with those peanuts? Because we have had times that we've had massive amounts of peanuts show up and then there's been nothing along with it so you do kind of have to have like the fish that also will show up and be with that but if you do hit it just right where you have the the fish that do find those massive schools then it's boy you're in for some fun <laughs> Dude, it looked like a lot of fun what you were doing last year man i saw the video that you posted with surfcasters journal obviously saw the instagram post like that looked like a thank you yeah it was it just it came it all came together last year um i was fortunate that i've been wanting to do a video for a few years and i've had the camera for a few years and brought it out and just like I, a few years ago i got like one clip and it was like i you know what am i going to do with that so i got so much footage last year it was just like well i guess i'm doing a, a little video so awesome. yeah so when you're on those uh, peanut bunker blitzes or fishing around peanuts what's your what are your lures um Usually top water. I mean, a, a smaller pencil. You don't have to go with a giant pencil. Um, it was, uh, I was doing really good with the guppy pencil, the smaller, not the flat bottom, the canal one, but you know, just the rounded, I think it's called the, the Jobo or something like that. Um, so a smaller pencil, smaller spooks. I mean, you can throw massive and just try and make your, you know, stand out. Sometimes they're just so fired up that it doesn't matter. Um, you don't have to match the hatch other times, they may be more finicky. Um, I did catch some really nice quality fish on like the Al Gags Whippet fish, just th the smaller, you know, size, um, letting that drop down below the school. And that's got to be a perfect peanut imitation. It is. It's perfect, things. and just rolling it, you know, just nice, medium, slow, right yeah. under the school, and yeah, yeah. that Whippet fish. It's it's kind of a deeper bodied, soft plastic with a paddle tail. Yes. They come with matching jig heads, yeah. and it's it's and it's it is, what's great about if you've never used one is like the the jig head itself kind of gives it some action because it has that that angle on it. So the jig head itself actually makes the 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 rubber move and then you also have the action of the paddle tail so it's it's really got a really nice you know lifelike kick to it and uh you can work it wherever you want in the water column and uh it's accounted for a few quality fish for me at other times you know for at times when most people were you know picking off smaller school size fish yeah, it's, if top water's an option i'm, I'm always taking that option but uh you know sometimes sometimes they don't always respond to it for your nighttime fishing, what uh, what you know, if you could break down some of the lures you like after dark. Uh, after dark, I'm a big redfin fan. Um, I've caught some really nice fish on the redfin. Depends on where I'm fishing. Um, if I'm fishing a beach, definitely have a redfin in my bag. Um, let's see, beaches. It's going to be redfins. It's going to be darters. It's going to be needlefish. Um, most of the beaches that I fish are pretty shallow. So I'm not trying to dredge it, you know, we're not using really bottle darters or anything like that. Um, metal lips, as long as they're, you know, on the shallower running side, like a Danny is fine. Um, obviously I was a big eel guy for a long time, um, but I've been moving towards using a lot more soft plastics. I've done really well in the paddle tails at night recently, you know, too, the last couple seasons. Um, just working those really low and slow like you would like a, an eel or a soft plastic. Um, if I'm fishing off the rocks, um, again, paddle tails, probably a little heavier, getting down deeper. Um, I will throw a bottle darter if it's, you know, really rough off the rocks. I haven't caught too many big fish on bottle darters. Um, needlefish on the heavier side and on the rocks. Um, Who do you like for needle? What needlefish uh, brands do you like? Super Strike for off the rocks. Just consistent and um, usually, like, I've done well with 
super strike needles during heavy storms, blows. So the heavier, the weighted one, um, I've done better on that. That's a great lure. And it's it, it sinks fast, it casts yep. far. And to me, it's almost, because it's so heavy, it's like a hybrid needlefish bucktail jig almost. Yes. Where it's, it, it's, I'm f treating it more like a jig than yep. I would like a, a slow sinking needlefish. Yep. Um, also the, um, what is it? The little neck popper, um, just swimming that the heavy one, just using that, especially in a big blow when it's, you know, I've had a hard time throwing something like a, a plastic like swimming lure or, you know, minnow style plug that'll just get blown out in big surf. You can throw that heavy little neck popper and then just swim it and it, wa it just waggles right up on the surface like that. So That's you can kind of use it as a swimming plug in really big surf like that, or I have. So those little neck poppers Steve's talking about, they're, they're uh, it's got a wide body, got a big fat body, a narrow neck, and then it goes to the big cupped mouth. And so on a straight retrieve, straight it, it's retrieve, a, it, it looks like it has like a swimming action, um, as opposed to most people use it as a, as a popper. That's what it's designed as. But in really rough surf, I've just straight retrieve and it just will get up to the surface and it'll just kind of wobble. And it's going to cast a lot it's better. It's going to cast than, yeah. way better than like your plastic minnow plug is going to. But I know, I mean, the Redfin obviously has a uh, has a the Redfin place has in your a heart, man. yeah um, has a special place in my heart. I caught my 52 pounder on a Redfin uh, on a beach on the night of the full moon. Wow. So it was, yeah, it was one of those. I had to pinch myself. It was very surreal. Now, would you mind telling us uh, the story, man? What was that? Yeah. Like? Um, so that was July of 2017. Uh, I was fishing, I don't want to say the name of the beach, but I was fishing Please a don't. large <laughs> sand beach on the North Shore with my buddy Jay. And uh, we were, there was a lot of, um, we were fishing eels a lot that spring. And uh, for whatever reason, there was a lot of peanut, or not peanuts, pogies around um, that month. We had just kind of come off the estuary bite and were starting to fish the beach fronts. and. Uh, we had noticed that we were having better action on one of our, a couple of the outings on minnow or swimming plugs than we were on the eels. And we kind of attributed that to the, you know, massive amount of pogies that were around. So we had been fishing um, for like an hour or so. My, I think I'd caught like a 20 pound fish. My buddy Jay had caught like another 25 pound fish and then I just hooked an absolute freight train and at first I was like oh shoot did I hook a seal or something like you know because it was just I have never felt a fish run just so it's just one as of those completely big uninhibited out. just like it just it felt like it was running and it didn't care that it was hooked you know it was just like it you know sometimes you get a big fish and it'll go and it'll stop and then you'll you'll gain a little and then you it'll go for another run this just kept running and running and running and i was like maybe it's a shark or something like you know um so i finally got it turned and uh what felt like an eternity later i finally got it you know in close enough where we were standing and my buddy Jay was like, what is going on? Like, you've been fighting this fish for six or seven minutes now. And it normally does not take six or seven minutes to land a fish, you know, where we were fishing, even a 25, 30 pound fish. And we finally got it in. He flipped his light on. And he was like, holy F, like you have a, that is a 50. So he had a 60 pound boga and uh, we, we never even took it up onto the sand. Like I, I'm actually really proud of like the way I handled that fish because we never even took it into the sand. Um, he, we only held it upright once just to get that, you know, weight. Um, and my buddy Jay, he's a tall guy and it, he struggled to get it all the way up and out of the water. Um, but it bounced around and it settled on 52 pounds and uh, neither of us, neither of us had a phone or a camera with us. And luckily there was a guy that was fishing probably like 60, 70 yards off to the left. And he saw that he was also into some really nice fish that night. So we were all, you know, aware that there were some big fish. And I walked the fish over on my boga grip to ask if he could take, if he had a camera and he's like, I got a cell phone. So he 
took a camera, I took a shot of it on the cell phone, took my cell phone number down, um, wrote it in his bag, and he was like, I'll, I'll send it to you when I get home. And that was probably the longest wait ever that night, waiting oh. to get that text with those pictures. <laughs> and I was like, what if this guy doesn't like send them? Like, what if he's just like, fuck, you know, the hell with this guy? It's like, a mixed bag, dude. I, I had a friend, our, Jonah used to work, uh, Jonah Olson used to work for us here. And um, on the canal one day, he caught his biggest ever striped bass, yeah. you know, 45 inches, I think it was. And, um, Gives this guy the phone to take the picture of it. Guy took two selfies. <laughs> <laughs> no way. Oh, yeah, dude. Yeah. There, was, there was an elderly gentleman next to him. He hands yeah. him the phone. He's, he goes, this is, he goes, look at my personal best bass. And it was just some confused looking man. <laughs> Thanks. Like, yeah. But no, so you got the pictures. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, like three in the morning, like, I got a text and I was like, <laughs> uh, he's like, sorry, man. I just got home. He's like, here's the pictures. I was like, oh, thank God. So. That's awesome. Yeah. So that was, yeah, the bucket list checked off right there. So do you, uh. Your red fins, do you modify them at all? Do you load them? Yep, I load them, um, um, I think 11 cc's of water is what I typically do. Um, and that seems to be just the sweet spot, gives it, you know, that little bit of extra oomph to get out where you need it. But it, obviously if you put too much weight in there, it totally kills the action of them. Yeah, it's, uh, so the red fins have a hollow body that you can, a lot of guys will inject uh, water into them, or, or what, do you use water? Or? I use water, yeah. yeah. So water, I've heard, uh, BBs, oil, mineral oil, yeah, yeah BBs you can guys do. Guys used to use mercury. Mercury, yeah, I've never messed with the mercury. Yeah. Um, now, how do you... Do you, how do you modify the red fence? How do you do that? Um, I just use a, you know, drill, drill a little hole. You, uh, I get a little syringe that measures out the amount of water that you're going to put in there, put that back in, and then usually you just get a two-part epoxy, go back over the hole. It doesn't have to be pretty. Some guys, you know, I just get it over there, sand it up a little bit, and make sure it's sealed up, and that's good. So I struggle with the with the sealing, with the resealing. Like yeah. so that's that's always my my weak point in loading the, the red fins. I was doing, like I would heat up the nail, yeah. get the little hole that way, just to minimize the hole, and then try to melt it back over. Yeah. That doesn't always work. I've tried breaking off the, the thing. I But I'm too lazy to like do the epoxy. Thing. Yeah, That's the two-part epoxy works good. Like I said, it's not the prettiest, most elegant solution, but it works. Now, the one thing I've also have you ever heard of the Redding fin? Those? Yes. Yeah, and actually, I've been almost tempted to like hit that guy up to get a couple made because I really like the idea that they're through wired. Because mm -hmm. I don't think yeah, a normal so, red fin's not through wired, right? Yeah, basically, it strips out all the hardware and uh, puts grommets at the tail and the head and puts two hooks on on yeah. the body, which you don't have to do. If you don't want to, you could just do the one, but, um, and then it fills it with foam. So foam, it creates yeah. like an indestructible yeah. red fin. And, um, I have one, I, I bought one from that. I tried to do my own a couple times. Yeah. And again, you, you need to have good attention yeah, to no, detail. He's... As a carpenter, you can probably do it well. I am, I, I'm like, I'm going to do this fast and I have a, I, I've ruined a bunch of red fins. That's yeah, all no, his, he does beautiful work. Um, but no, I, my, my talent is, uh, limited to wood products. <laughs> Do you, have you dabbled in plug building at all? Or? No, I don't have the space or, you know, the garage space for any of that. I used to get into, um, I used to do a little bit of like just taking old wooden plugs apart and kind of refurbishing them, sanding them and just repainting them myself. But that was just, you know, messing around over the winter, needing something to do. So, uh, rods and reels, man. What do you like? Uh, what's, what's your, uh, what are your surf casting setups? Uh, I use century rods. Uh, right now, the two rods that I use the most are, um, I use a century stealth, both are, uh, and a century nor'easter, the Kevlar nor'easter. Okay. So the Kevlar nor'easter is what I primarily use on the rocks. Um, both of them are nine foot. I'm, I like a nine foot rod. Really? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not a big, uh, I mean, I do have 10 foot rods, um, but I usually use those on the beaches. Um, one thing about Wick, where we fish on the rocks, especially sometimes there will be a rock, like there'll be a, there'll be cliffs like right behind you. So having a 10, 11 foot rod when you're trying to, you know, get in and fish some spots is a real, you know, pain. So I find a nine foot rod seems to be the sweet spot for most of the places we fish. Um, I like the stealth for it's a very softer slower action that's more very soft, uh, yep good for throwing eels good for throwing soft plastics um anything that's not super well casting you know metal lips stuff like that red fins um and then the kevlar nor'easter is a little bit stiffer but it's just bulletproof um i can drop it on the rocks and hit stuff and use it as a walking stick if i have to and it's it's pretty uh it's 
pretty rugged, so I don't have to think too much about it when I'm out in the rocks with it. That's such an important feature of surf rods. Uh, I mean, a lot of times you get to like the high modulus graphite and the, the rod feels beautiful. Yeah, it's amazing. It's it doesn't weigh anything, but if you but so touch, sensitive. so much as touch something with yeah, it. Look yeah, look at it funny. It's like, well, you know, it's going to break on your next. Not, yeah. not, they're not that sensitive. No. But a Kevlar one, so that one's obviously reinforced. Yep, it's and it's not, it's not the lightest rod. It's not the most sensitive rod, but it's a workhorse, you know, and it's one of those rods that I don't have to worry about, you know, like I said, bumping a rock or something like that. It, it can, take a, can take a lick in and keep on ticking. And uh, what reels do you match with those? Uh, I use 100 and 150 size uh, Van Stahl. I've been fortunate to be testing the new X2 series. I was going to ask you about that, I, about that. I saw the post where you had it, bla- the reel was blacked out you know, yeah. in the early yeah. on. And now um, we can probably talk about it now. Yeah, we can talk about it now because obviously the reel has um, been announced. But yeah, Craig contacted me and Brian last year and asked if we would be interested in, you know, testing out the new... Uh, the next generation of the X series, so that's high praise, man. I mean, a lot of a lot of guys, a lot of surf casters, fancy themselves uh, hardcore, and uh, you were you were selected to test. I was the honored. Reels, man. Uh, that awesome. was another one of those moments I had to kind of pinch myself. I was looking at a text from Craig Cantomo asking if I wanted to be on the pro staff and you know um, test out some prototype reels. So I was like, yeah, uh, you don't say no to that. So so when did you get the reels? Uh, last season, we got them uh, in the spring, so we had them in time for some so good. You had them for that. Bite we had last them in time fall. for the spring bite, which was good. Um, and those were an earlier, the earliest, probably one of the earliest prototypes. So um, it was c- cool to be, you know, in testing that on the ground level, and we got to put some quality fish on them. Um, and then again this year, we got a few different. So, so last season, we just tested the 150 size, um, and then. This season, we got a few different sizes to test out, the 100, the 200, and the 150. So, um, and they're, they're amazing reels. They are, I mean, I'm sure you got to play around with them at iCast. They I did, are, man. I saw, and they, they have the 30th anniversary gold one I saw there yeah, too, but yeah. they look great, man. How do, uh, uh, how do they differ from the older, from the previous generation? Of they Vance are Stalls? for sure lighter. They are, in my opinion, a lot smoother because, um, you know, so one of the things that everyone, you know, is like, oh, well, you get a Van Stahl, it's not the smoothest reel. No, it's not the smoothest reel, but it's not intended to be the smoothest reel. Um, it is a workhorse. It's supposed to be that reel that you can depend on night in and night out um, that if you didn't get a chance, if you dunked it, if you didn't get a chance to rinse it off, um, you don't have to worry about it. it is re- it's there. It's ready to go. Um, but these are the new ones are an improvement in almost every way. I mean, it's lighter. They're the uh, let's see, the 100 and the 300s are, are uh, a few different sizes are faster retrieves. Yeah, the 300 I know is um, uh, taking aim at like the tuna market. Yeah, with a, I think it's 52 um, inches per turn. And I've been using it. the 100 a lot, and I mean, I can't tell you what a fun reel that is on like a nine or an eight foot rod. It's gonna, it's it's amazing, and it's even great on like a seven foot. I paired it on. Uh, like a seven foot freshwater and like an inshore rod um, and it balances all right. So yeah, it's a great reel and I'm very happy that I got to have a small part and uh, you know, making it the best that it could be. That's pretty awesome, man. I mean, I, I, I love Van Stahl reels. It's always good to see like a company continuing to do that stuff and yeah. continuing to improve. And there's was- no better person to have out like you know, advocating for what surf casters need than Craig. Yeah. Craig is, he is at his heart, a hardcore surf guy. He still goes out and gets in his wetsuit and goes and fishes in nor'easters in Montauk. And he, you know, he's not some sales rep wearing a suit, you know, that has no idea what surf fishing is. Like he's, he he's is surf life, fishing. Man. He yeah. is. He's, yeah. He's like, he lives the surf fishing life. So he's a per, you know, and he's, he's done that forever, man. That's yeah. why he's, uh, He's been so, so successful yeah. at, uh, with Van Stahl. Dude. The On The Water Podcast is brought to you by Guidesly. Hey, charter captains, are you tired of pouring all your money and time into all the stuff that comes with running a charter business other than the actual fishing? Guidesly gets it. That's why they created Guidesly. Guidesly is built for guides, and they understand and solve the unique challenges that you face every day. Let Guidesly handle your book of business from technology to customer management, leaving you to handle the fishing. Become a guide on Guidesly.com and download the Guidesly Pro app today. Focus on what you do best. 
putting customers on the fish and leave the rest for Guidesly to handle. You probably don't remember. Do you remember giving a show at the Plum Island Surfcasters years ago? Oh, yeah, man. Yeah. yeah. I remember this was when I was, like, first starting to get really into surf casting. And I didn't have, like, anyone to go to the surf show. And I remember look, seeing in the paper, I was like, oh, surf casting show. Like, at the, I think it was, like, at the Elks at New Report. And I was like, and then I saw, like, Jimmy Fee from... Uh, on the water and I was like oh I was reading your you know I was like oh I'll, I'll go see Jimmy Fee and I remember going there that day and like watching you give like a surf casting seminar and like I think your probably now wife was there with you and I, I was like that. I was like man I'm like Jimmy's got it all figured out I'm like he's getting these girls here with him he's like like look at this guy like yeah that's that's like the only one she's come to okay <laughs> Pam does uh Pam's great Pam does not fishing is not her thing not her so, thing yeah she no. uh She's, she's great because she doesn't care that I fish, you know, so yeah. she supports that. But, uh, yeah, that, I remember that, man. I, I, they have a great group, Plum Island Surf Yeah, Casters, Plum Island man. Surf Casters has a uh, very active club. Um, they're up there. Uh, they do, you know, they do kids outings. They do, um, I don't know if they do, a, I think they do like a monthly meeting and they try and have like a guest speaker at... Uh, and it was a couple months, years after that, man, you were giving your own seminars at that place. Yeah, so, I started, so. um, yeah, I started giving some of my own seminars uh, after I started getting, uh, actually after you guys gave me a chance to start, you know, writing for you guys. You guys were one of the first uh, publications that I ever had, like a full, like feature article, you know, with pictures and stuff that I was ever I ever wrote or you know well we appreciate we always need like that that's what on the water is man it's like if we don't have ex like passionate fishermen writing for us you know that was something when Chris Megan started the magazine he said like I'd rather I, I want fishermen or I, I want fishermen who will write I don't want writers to write like people who are more oh, yeah. writers like he yeah. wants fishermen to contribute to on the water and yeah it's guys I'm like you that helped us out certainly man. not a writer but I try and put you know what I'm feeling or you know trying to convey uh, down in a way that hopefully people can relate to you've done a great job man and that piece you just had in surfcasters journal was really great where you kind you. of opened really up about your, uh, your your surfcasting background and yeah. how you got into it and how yep. surfcasting has helped you uh have yeah. helped you man so. yeah um i mean i used to struggle with uh with alcohol growing up and surfcasting was a uh, big part of my recovery when i got sober and uh it really gave me that because, you know, obviously when you're you're getting sober, you're, you know, dealing with an addiction of some sort. Um, filling those hours in the day, you know, that normally were reserved for, you know, no good is hard. Um, and uh, having something positive to really, you know, focus to, to pour your energy into is really important at that time. And. Uh, surf casting was that thing for me. It was that thing that it was like I would look forward to, you know, no matter how hard a crappy a day I was having or what I was dealing with at the time. Um, in my recovery, it was like I could always be like, well, you know, tonight I'm going to go surf casting and, you know, have that to look forward to. Um, and one of the great things I think about surf fishing is that you're only relying on yourself. Yeah. With it. Like I, you're not waiting. I, I don't need the boat to be ready. I don't no. need... Unless you have a partner that you fish with, it's, yeah. you know, not ready or... But <laughs> yes, you're right. I mean, it is up to you. You get to choose when to get there, when to leave. If you're not feeling it, ah, I'm going to head out. You know, I said I was going to fish till this time and, you know, it didn't go. Or, you know, you can stay longer or, yeah, you can make a plan. You can adapt a plan. Um, it, it's all up to you. Um, and I think that's the most satisfying thing about surf casting, too, is that, like... You know, obviously, um, I'm not, boat fishing is its own thing, and if you go out on a charter boat with guys, that's great, but essentially you're having a guy take you to a place and being like, okay, here's the fish, drop it down, here's what we should use. There's something totally different like when you go out and you're coming up with a plan and you're like, all right, we're going to go fish here because I think that the fish are going to come in here at this time because of these factors. Or, you know, I was fishing in this area and I saw this the other day and I want to go back there tonight and see if, you know, those fish are coming in. So it's like coming up with a theory, testing it. Maybe sometimes that theory is right. Sometimes that theory is wrong. Um, but it's way more satisfying when it's 
something that you have come up with, you know, and you've executed yourself and, you know, that's much more, much more satisfying to someone like me, at least. Oh, and, and then being able to repeat it, like just, just going out and catching the fish, like, you know, say I do two boat trips a summer yeah, and I go out and I have a great boat trip and I've got one more in a couple months, but I'd like to go do that the following day with surf fishing because it's all, you know, like you said, self-reliant. You can go and continue to do that and continue to figure it out as much as you can. Um, as much as you're willing to, to go do it. And that's that, that for me is just being able to find those patterns and yeah. repeat them and, yeah. and year after year. Yeah, and that's, I think, one of the coolest things about, because, you know, fishing off the beaches and stuff uh, or the rocks is, is great, but when we're fishing the estuaries and those fish literally come back, like you stand on that same corner, like the same corner of the marsh, like the same place I was literally standing last year, and those fish come back. That's, I love that. And it's, you know, it's definitely very unique. Um, there's not a ton of people that I think are able to do it. So I definitely consider myself fortunate, but it took us a lot of work to also to find these, you know, times and places that this stuff occurs. It's like this magical nature occurrence happens, you know? But what's so relatable that what you said is like before you get that first one, you're always wondering like this is, is here. It, is this it? Yeah, out. exactly. There's always a few nights of like, are they going to show up this year? And I then when they do, it's like, it, yes, it's so satisfying. It's so satisfying. Yeah. I ha I've got a, a, a place like that. I like every June where you know, I'm waiting for the year they don't show, yeah. you know, and the numbers ebb and flow, mm -hmm. but there's always, it's going to be a night or two where they're yeah. there. Yeah. And, um, yeah, that's, uh, that, that's one of the best parts. It is very satisfying. Do you keep a log? I don't, I should. I, I, I do. I try to this yeah. year. I really committed to it and I was good up until July. And uh, then I really fell off. I keep a spreadsheet is yeah. my main thing. When, yeah. when I catch a fish, uh, you know, striper over a certain size, I will record the details yeah. of that in an Excel sheet. And it's, it lacks the romance of a log. Like yeah. you're not going to go out there and be like, Dave said this funny joke, you know, yeah. but it's, it's, it, I get all the, the bare facts of, uh, I mean, I have a really good sense of when and those fish are going to show up within a f week or two, you know, time frame. I don't know. I mean, I guess there's probably other factors that, maybe in play like wind and how the wind's been for a number of days and stuff like that or temperature um but it's just a general time frame it's like just get out there and start putting if you're not putting in time during these couple weeks you know especially of the spring you're missing it you know so that was something that uh too like you've got to go as much as you can to figure out to. To, to find that in the first place if you yep. only do like you know, if I'm only if I only go by my little Excel sheet, I'm going to miss a heck of a lot of fishing. Yeah, that and it can be a grind just yeah. to find that window, just to m establish that window. Like then, once you're like, okay, it's like from an hour to two hours on the incoming. Okay, then you can go and hit that three or four nights in a row until it you know until it dies off. Um, but yeah, that initial grind is usually to just figure out that. But, and it's also, I mean, we ground pretty hard this spring just because I had a feeling like this is the only consistency that we're going to see, you know, if we're going to see any consistency this year, it's going to be for these next few weeks. And then the rest of it's going to be a crapshoot. And it's kind of how it's been. <laughs> <laughs> now, one thing I like about Cape Cod is just because of the geography of it, like any conditions I can go surf fishing. Is that your experience up there so you guys are i mean lucky like yeah if you guys have a wind coming from one side i guess you guys can go kind of fish the other side of the cape um we definitely where we're at um we can get blown out and screwed like if it's just especially for nor'easters and hurricanes like i find that the build up to those is the best time to fish um generally the surf will reach a point where it is just too frothed up like especially off the rocks where it's just a it's just dangerous you can't be you shouldn't be out there and just the water quality you can tell it just has like this brown it looks like sewage um you know um so yeah we definitely have times that you're just out of luck i mean maybe you you might be able to go find a place in the estuary or something that's sheltered enough but in the fall we don't see the fish push back into the estuaries like we do in the spring um but yeah, there's definitely areas that 
you know, when we get a really bad storm, we're just sometimes out of luck. Or if the wind blows from a certain way for too long, um, you know, certain shorelines will just get completely packed up with weeds or stuff like that. So, uh, yeah. But you guys have, you know, like, oh, we'll go on this side of the Cape or we'll go to the... It's nice. Yeah, I mean, you can hide in, even in the bays, too. Yeah. If it's real bad, you can go into... And you're, you're switching over to schoolies. You're not seeing the big fish. Yeah. But... Um, that, that's one of the cool parts about the Cape. I didn't know if that existed up there or not, because it is, it's not a straight line. By no, I mean, we're, so if you look at Cape Ann, it is literally like a Cape, a point that sticks out. But the North Shore, I mean, has lots of different areas. You have, uh, I mean, I live in Gloucester, so I fish Cape Ann quite a bit. Um, but um, there's areas of Plum Island uh, that you can, you know, get in the backside there that are more sheltered. Um, there are some some of the you know bays and the Salem Harbor and stuff like that Beverly there are areas of that that you can get in and find some more sheltered area as opposed to others so one of the last things I want to touch on is you had a pretty epic bluefish run last year yes. too man a big blues yes and that was I've been waiting for one of those for years um so since you started surf gassing, ha have you seen it like that? Not before? like that. Um, I mean, guys used to tell me like, oh, back in the 80s, you could go down the rocks at any time of the day and throw a Roberts Ranger and catch bluefish. And it was like, OK, that must have been fun. And for like, you know, for about a month, it was I, I would say as close to that as you could. I mean, it wasn't just anywhere you wanted, but almost every time I went out, I was finding bluefish everywhere I went. And uh I love bluefish. I mean, they are, they're just, they will hunt down a pencil popper. They will chase down a pencil popper like no other fish. Um, they're incredible, man. And, and that eight, those guys who grew up surf fishing in the eighties and early you know, through the nineties who had that, those great bluefish years, yeah. you can see where the disdain for bluefish came from. Like when, yeah. when I got started, people are like, Oh, you know, it's just bluefish, but that's really changed. Like absence has definitely made the heart yeah. grow fonder of bluefish. And I'm just out there for whatever's going to pull the hardest on my line. So, I mean, there, it doesn't get much better than bluefish. I mean, they pull hard, they fight right up till the very end until you, you know, pull them up on the rocks or wherever it is you're pulling them up on. And uh, yeah, I, I can't get enough bluefish. I keep hoping that we'll have another big push this fall. So knock on wood. Yeah, man, I hope we, we saw some in the spring. It was a it was a good run here for the spring compared to the last few. Yeah. And I just keep hoping it keeps getting better and keeps getting better. What, what we'd, we'd seen for years was a bunch of the one to two pounders would come yeah. in every fall. Yeah. And then you, you're like, okay, what yeah, are the slammers? Yeah, we had some coming? big yep. 10, 12, 15 pound blues. It's a different That's animal awesome. there, man. Awesome. That's so good. You got you have a very beautiful place to surf fish up there too, man. It's, it is. Uh, um, it reminds me of like you know rugged like coastal you know Maine like Bar Harbor, Acadia almost you know. And it's very too, like you said, you have sand beaches, oh. you've got an estuary, you've got the big rocky cliffs. It's uh, yeah, and that's it, it can't get boring. Yeah, no, like you, there's always there's always a different. You know, if you're sick of it, and then yeah, you can go. You can go be fishing a sheer cliff face with rock with waves breaking all around you, and then you could go a few miles down the road, and you could set a sand spike, and you could sit in a lawn chair, and you could watch your rod tip for a few hours. Do you do any of that? You do any trunking? I do a little bit once in a while. Um, you know, it is a nice, relaxing afternoon. Um, and I am uh, have a new girlfriend, so I think that will be a nice way to, uh, you know, maybe spend an afternoon surf fishing with her. That's a way. So that that nice, easy, relaxing is a way to foster a love of surf fishing. We talked about how Pam's not into surf fishing, and part of the reason is I gave her a uh, kind of a baptism by fire at Jones Inlet years ago, and she's from Long Island, and she's like, I would like to try. We were just dating there. It's remarkable we're still married after this, uh, or that we're married after this. Um, we were just dating. We were in college, and she's like, I would like to try this surf fishing you're always talking about. I was like, You got it. You live right near Jones Inlet. We're sure. gonna go. So we go there and we get, we walk, it's a long walk to the jetty at Jones Inlet and um, starts raining, starts blowing. Fishing's great. There's blues, there's stripers, I'm catching yeah, every sweep great, on the that's great fishing conditions. She is, but I'm like, all I'm thinking is I want to put her on fish. Like if she catches the fish, she will see like why this is amazing. Yeah. So I'm having the time of my life and she's, I turn over, she's crying. She goes, this is horrible. She goes, <laughs> I'm cold, I'm wet. She goes, I want to go back to the truck and I'm hooked up to a fish. And this is, this is a very selfish move. I tossed her the keys. <laughs> so that's, uh, I'm the blame for Pam's lack of love of fishing. Um, 
and I, I haven't been able to recover it since well, then. Well, I haven't so. taken I haven't taken her out in a uh, storm fishing yet, but um, I did start. I started her off with some ice fishing this uh, this winter. So we started off in some of the most uncomfortable uh, <laughs> conditions to fish, and uh, we've been doing a lot of largemouth fishing. She's doing really good. Uh, she's doing really good at largemouth fishing. So um, we're we'll get to uh, we'll get her a big striper one of these one of these nights. To foster a love of fishing, you got to think a little smaller. You can't go right to the hard exactly. Stuff. So yeah. I'm, 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 going e- I'm trying to right. ease her into it. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, Steve, man. Well, thank you so much for coming down. Uh, I, I we'll be in touch with the surf fishing uh, stuff, I'm sure. And I can't wait to follow along with your fall run, man. Thank you so, so much.